Howdy everyone. Bits and pieces. All right. Say hi if you can hear me. Um, is it any better? I stopped my, um, my playback. Check if I've got any bits and pieces open that I shouldn't. Um, we don't need some of these other tabs. Bit choppy, okay. Hmm. Not sure what I can do about that. A bit better. Okay. Um, all right, well, we're going to just crack onto it. So let's see. Ha, huh. Luke, very funny. <clears throat> okay, so this is where we ended up last time. Let me check that I've actually got. Uh, not everything's on screen. So we talked about the cohomology of a combinatorial surface. Okay, so I talked briefly here about sort of H bullet giving a functor from cochain complexes of R modules through to uh, graded R modules and it's the sum the direct sum of all the uh, these cohomology modules I should note that uh, each individual cohomology module is itself a functor so let's just poke this up in the corner I might even so so note each H N is a functor as well. So just taking a cochain complex and then returning come on, uh, this item at the top of the screen. So uh, the kernel mod the image of the previous differential. All right, <clears throat> so that's just worth noting. All right, here's desk is slightly too small and all the stuff fell off it. Okay. All right, so what I gave here is the fact that cohomology of a cochain complex is a functor, a covariant functor, if you're paying attention at home, but it's not so important. Uh, why? Let me just double check. What have we got up here? Uh, did I say something like the cochain complex is a functor? No. So, definition of combinatorial surface, and maybe I'll just note 
uh, one way to draw this is some sort of diagram like so. And so we've got our sets of vertices, of edges, and of triangles, and each of these returns the three faces of the triangle and the two vertices of a directed edge. Um, but I didn't talk about uh, maps of surfaces, and we need those if we want to have a functor from combinatorial surfaces to R modules. It's nothing especially deep, but we better write down the definition. Okay, so let's refresh slate. Two surfaces, combinatorial surfaces x to y, so x and y, and we say map from f, f from x to y consists of, so we have functions at each level, so we have um, <coughs> triangles to triangles, edges to edges, and vertices to vertices such that they are compatible with the face maps uh, Fn minus 1 for all possible uh, face maps that make sense All right, so it's quite a rigid notion. Uh, because for instance, um, if you think of you know, these as actual topological triangles, some geometric space, then on the interior of the triangle, if there was such a thing as the interior, then it's injective, right? Because it sends a triangle, doing some kind of Illuminati thing here. Um, <laughs> it sends it sends a triangle to a triangle. The boundary might be something a bit odd, but inside the triangle, it just maps to another triangle. So you can't do things like wrap triangles onto themselves, like. I mean, this doesn't exist in this picture. It's purely combinatorial. But this is this is going to be important later. Um, <clears throat> okay. Da, 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 da. So I'll give you some examples. So you can do things like just select some of the triangles, edges, and vertices, like a sub surface. And let's call it A sitting inside X. <clears throat> so let's take our friend the boundary of the tetrahedron. Oops. Shouldn't be able to see that it's behind. And then we can think about, let's just take, take some of the faces and edges. In fact, I'm going to take all the edges, but only two of the faces. So what I've done is thrown away uh, the sort of rightmost face and the underneath face. So 
So just keeping those two. And so one thing to notice, if I have a triangle, then in this subsurface, I have to have all its edges and all of its vertices. Like I can't just have the triangle and not one of its edges because this, uh, this equation to be satisfied means that the edge is also inside the subsurface. I mean, even this um, A has to be a triangulated surface. So any triangle, um, <clears throat> which is an element of A2, uh, they have to map to somewhere in A1, and so it has to have all the boundaries. So according to our definition, uh, surfaces are allowed to be really degenerate, and so it could actually be one-dimensional. So we can do things like the, the one skeleton inclusion. So this is a subsurface, but it's a subsurface consisting of all the vertices and all the edges none of the triangles let me draw a take a tetrahedron and stick on some extra pieces this is all covered in here's a spare triangle an extra edge maybe some spare vertices and another edge <clears throat> all these edges are oriented but i'm not drawing the orientations and if this is x, then I can take the one skeleton of x. And so now it's a wireframe. So now there's no no triangles, no faces. Um I also take the zero skeleton. SK sub zero of X equals only the vertices. And that sits inside the one skeleton. So let me just write that SK zero, SK one. Uh, into well, SK2, the two skeleton is all of X. We'll see more of this later. Uh, here's another example. We remember we had a, um, a combinatorial surface with one vertex, one edge, and one triangle. I don't think I gave it a name, I'm going to call it P. Um, this funky thing that's a triangle all wrapped up and through itself. So for all combinatorial surfaces, there's a unique map of combinatorial surfaces x to p. Sorry. Mad Pad, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Pete. I'm going to call it P. <clears throat> so, Space Kitter, this is true in this setting. Um, it's an example of what's known as a terminal object, if you know what that means. Um, yeah, and you can come up with all sorts of things. Its name is Pete. <laughs> ho ho. 
Right, and so we have this notion of morphism, and these are kind of mildly boring ones, but you can do things like, um, <clears throat> let me think, you can take an infinite cylinder, just repeated, and what we do is we identify these top and bottom pairs of edges and all these these ones are not identified so I should do these in different color so these two red edges in secret it's a sequence of edges are all identified and these edges are directed like so then uh, we have a map which collapses a, it's like an infinite cylinder that sends it to the torus which we had as an example recently Ah, okay, thank you DMN and Tess, you may have the similar um, Let's make it white That's because it's super visible Tell me if that's better Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so now the blue edges are identified. And you map down from the infinite cylinder ooh, down to the torus and it has the effect of like <clears throat> if you had a, a coordinate along the infinite cylinder and you work mod Z or something so you say well I will identify um, moving along the cylinder by one unit and so it has the effect of wrapping it around so you definitely don't need to restrict to injective things or boring things like number three Is a quick lemma. I'll just outline the proof. Uh, Tommy, it it turns out to be yes. Um, so it's a bit like so you can take the, the exponential map from the real line to the circle, which is a covering map, and then you can take the Cartesian product with a circle in the to main and codomain so it's an infinite cylinder r times a circle mapping down to the torus and in one coordinate it does exactly this it takes the infinite cylinder and wraps it up and so that's a covering space so this is what's happening except it's combinatorial so we don't have the nice um, covering space theory in the same way as the topological case okay so since we have notion of maps of uh, combinatorial surfaces we can say that 
uh, we want to look for a functorial behavior. So this is object assignment for a functor uh, combinatorial. So this is my category of combinatorial surfaces. opposite category to uh, co-chain complexes of R modules. So this is a beefing up a generalization of the fact which I think was in the assignment. So the proof rests on Showing we have a commuting square. Uh, let's say Uh, this commutes for n equal to 0 and 1. So n equals 0 is basically the case of the uh, directed graph you get from looking at the one skeleton of the surface. But now the n equals 1 case, um, you're getting the triangles involved. But the proof is more or less the same. You just get more um, terms in the definition of the delta n or delta um, yeah delta one. Because this commuting means that we have a map of cochain complexes. Because in fact, I suppose you could put the two squares together. So you get x0, uh, let's see, x0, and then x1, and then you put the other square on the bottom. So you get xr to the power x2, r to y2. And checking that both of those squares commute is the same as knowing you have a map of cochain complexes. So as a corollary, so if we compose these functors, one from uh, last lecture, to complexes to graded R modules or the individual H's. Depending on taste. <clears throat> yeah, so Is there anyone who feels unsure about the definition of a compass of a pair of functors? If anyone is. Maybe that's a bad question to ask. Okay. Yes, Tyson, it's a good idea. So if I have a pair of functors, 
and do something a bit peculiar. That's not going to work. All right, never mind that. I'm just going to raise. this little bit for now when Tableau lets me, so I have space. Okay, so I take a common littoral surface and I can send it to the cochain complex um, that, it, that it gives. Alternatively, Starting from any cochain complex, I could return its the, the sum of all its cohomology modules. So these are the, the two functors I've got. And so the assignment of the objects of the first category to the next category, we could then just apply the second functor and take that object and give us an object of the third category. So it takes x, and returns all the way, I make the more space. So it gets the cohomology of the cochain complex arising from that combinatorial surface, which we denote to avoid too many symbols just to say it's cohomology of x itself so that's the level of objects and then at the level of morphisms it's the same so if I have a map of surfaces I'm going to map to the middle and get a map of Cochain complexes in the other direction. And then apply the next functor and get map on cohomology. induced um, <clears throat> by the I mentioned there was as a lemma I said there's a functor from cochain complexes to graded R modules or the each individual HNs so um, ditto it's just sometimes a little bit cleaner to write down well, H bullet, and maybe bullet is a variable that stands for an arbitrary. Um, well, no, H bullet stands for the direct sum. But sort of mentally, you can say, well, I could replace it by an N, and as long as I'm not thinking about the graded structure in any deep way, the same thing works. All right. Any questions? It's about half an hour in. We're on a small stretch break. Oh man, that's. I don't need that light quite so shiny. Uh, MadPad, we went up a little bit. Um, sorry for people, right? I think you meant this one here. This is the um, the one where we proving this is a functor. <clears throat> yes, this is a commutative diagram of R modules.
There's lots of labels on everything here. <clears throat> try to separate them out a little bit. So is that what you went, MadPad? I mean, the X's and Y's are the data coming from the surfaces, but I've constructed R modules out of them by looking at functions from those sets to R. Okay, cool. Let me scroll back. Okay, so here's the big question. This is this is the million dollar question. Uh, let me just put some R in there. Or even just, you know, for for a ring of interest. Or say the integers or the real numbers. So one thing to notice is that combinatorial surfaces are very deliberately built out of smaller pieces. I mean, eventually they're built out of triangles and edges and vertices. But sometimes we can calculate um, the cohomology of a smaller piece. It's not a single triangle, but it's still somehow simpler. I mean, going down a dimension, It was raised um, someone raised it in chat what is the cohomology of something like this uh, it's something like two circles let's call this gamma and we know it's made out of two circles it's the union of two things where say u is a pentagon make sure you get all the edges the right way and v is this square with a little stick hanging off it so actually we know how to calculate in principle we've seen a, a proposition that tells us how to do this and we had a crack it definitely the first case and the second case I believe you can do it I have faith in you <clears throat> certainly a small example like this you can play with around by hand right it's five vertices five edges you can write down the matrix right we know the cohomology here let's just say integers And I'll, I'll point out that the intersection of these two things is a single vertex. Um, 
our single vertex notation is this. So there's one vertex and no every, anything else. So can we leverage our knowledge of the cohomology of u and v here to get the cohomology of gamma? So if anyone has done um, anything about fundamental groups, this may only be a few of you, but it's worth saying anyway. So there's a theorem that tells us how to calculate the fundamental group of, well, if these were actual spaces, two circles joined together. There's a theorem that says how to calculate the fundamental group of that based on the fundamental groups of U and V. And Chris has pointed out it's the, the, the Seifert-Van Kampen theorem. Oh, I'm thinking so Tommy, I'm just thinking fundamental groups as an analogy here. So the Seifert-Van Kampen theorem says you can construct the fundamental group by a particular construction from the fundamental groups of the smaller spaces. But as Tommy has pointed out, there's another pair of names, namely Maivia Torres. So Razor, yes. So these, uh, <coughs> the we know ones, this is tutorial. And so then ask how to get this. So it's small enough that you could probably do it by hand. It's um, nine vertices, ten edges. Right, it's getting to the point where you don't really want to start writing these things down by hand. So we want some theorems. And particularly when we're going to go up to arbitrary dimensional stuff, this is not cool. So there is a construction here. So what does it mean to somehow make gamma out of u and v? I've written it's just the union. Uh, yeah, uh, Tyson. Either the direct sum or the individual components, it's not matter. So it's. I should have mentioned the vagueness about <coughs> individual indices versus the whole lot. Maybe just go back and forget that little ill uh, ill informed rant. Okay, so. Let's say someone handed you two graphs instead of handing you gamma. Let's say they handed you u and v and said, make a graph by gluing these together. Much like I wrote in the tutorial, make a new graph by gluing on one new edge. Right, what does that even mean? Right, we're not gluing. Right, they're, they're not even somehow spatial, right? It's it's putting in extra things into the set, defining our functions, right? So this is not really sort of a spatial operation, but it's somehow morally the same. So we can do things like, let's say we didn't have gamma a priori, but we wanted to define gamma. What we could do 
is to find gamma to be the disjoint union of u and v. Um, Chris, I'm not quite sure how you mean a junction. So feel free to explain while I keep talking. Um, so we take the disjoint union and then we quotient by the equivalence relation which says that um, <clears throat> so we have the vertex that's the intersection and that sits inside uh, V and it also sits inside U so what I'm doing I'm picking out this vertex in V this vertex in U and I want to glue those together and so I take the equivalence relation that identifies those two uh, those two vertices okay interesting um, Chris I haven't seen that description by Lee um, so let's say in here it's called V uh, 1 and here it's called V2 and I want V1 to be identified with V2 right, so the people who know the words are starting to turn up in the comments <clears throat> right, so I can actually fill in and now U sits inside gamma and V sits inside gamma right so this works for surfaces yeah, Chris, I mean, adjoining an edge is a thing you might say in graph theory, but a junction is um, a thing that happens in category theory too, and it's very, very different. So, uh, Tommy, in this case, particular case, uh, I think it is the wedge sum. Hatches behind me, but I'm not going to check right now. But we might want to do something more complicated. So let's we have a cartoon picture here. Uh, this is just grass, but So I have two surfaces then if this was U and this was V I want to make a new surface such that they glued along these boundary circles and this boundary circle single boundary circle is their intersection okay so this is um, <clears throat> uh, ping this is not quite connected sum um, connected sum would be if u was a torus without a boundary I shouldn't point with my finger I should point with my magic pointy finger if u was a, a torus with no boundary and V was a genus 2 surface then you cut out a circle you cut out a circle and then you stick the circles together but here I'm assuming that the the boundary circles are already there all right so here's so one way to look at this U is simpler than the last surface V is V is simpler then the last surface and their intersection is a circle which is much simpler than a surface and so maybe knowledge of the shape of this the shape of this the shape of this all of them together ah Chris okay yeah we're not going to call it that we're not going to call it what Lee calls it yeah <clears throat> so this is a big so this is a big theme we say can we calculate cohomology 
of a whole space based on simpler parts. So one thing some, at least one group noticed in the tutorial is that they were writing down the matrix to represent, so as an aside, so they had written down some um, let's pretend it was a, a hexagon it probably wasn't and they've written down some directed graph and they wanted to write down this is gamma they wanted to write down the matrix representing delta gamma and they started filling it out and then um, observed a pattern stopped filling it out and then tried to start reasoning the problem is you only see the full effect once the whole matrix is there like just starting with sort of some partial information which is really just you know information about half of the space you don't get to see the whole sort of topology as it were the fact that the graph comes around and joys back to itself but this idea of looking at little bits of um, the data that helps you calculate the cohomology how do you patch them all together to calculate the whole cohomology because looking at this little bit it looked like things were going to be trivial it's only when you look at the whole map delta that you see that the kernel is non-trivial. I mean, if you don't sort of extrapolate the pattern correctly, one can extrapolate the pattern incorrectly. So that was, I found interesting. Because in one sense, um, Sorry, Tess, what do you say? Oh, uh, yeah, the disjoint union quotient by an equivalence relation on the boundary. Yeah, so this is all the same circle of ideas. I mean, this picture uh, that I've <clears throat> drawn with surfaces, I mean, this goes back to like probably people like Riemann, right, who were inventing topology by thinking about I have a surface and I find loops on the surface and I integrate I mean it's a it's all like complex analysis and stuff and they say I've got some thing that I integrate around the circle and I get numbers that aren't trivial and Cauchy residue theorem and all these things and they, they figured out how to open up the surface by cutting it up and, and figuring out what topology was. So this, this type of idea of like, can we go backwards? Can we start from the simple bits and reconstruct something more complicated and calculate the shape of the complicated thing as seen by cohomology from the cohomology of the smaller bits? And ultimately, a combinatorial surface is made out of triangles and triangles have rather boring cohomology and so something special has to happen because you're sticking together a bunch of things with boring topology to get something with interesting topology where by topology I mean loosely in the sense of there's some combinatorial shape <clears throat> okay so here's the general definition of something called a push out as Space I mentioned. Come on, pen, wake up. It's going a bit flat. That would have been a miracle. Samsung pen to work on an iPad. All right, 
I'll be back in one moment while I fetch a, a lightning cable. Chat amongst yourselves. That's rather embarrassing. I don't think I have another lightning cable. Boom. So I'm going to do something wacky. Let me just take that off the screen. Let's see. Um, Yeah, Chris. Don't really need to uh, do too much. Let's see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's take this as our five-minute big lecture break. If you want to make a, a cuppa. Stretch your legs, refresh. I'm going to give a lecture using live overleaf rendering. So if anyone wants to stick around just to double check <laughs> um, how this is going to work. Let's see. Can I... Yeah, I'll see how this goes. Um, Deus Ex, yeah, good idea. No, I haven't frozen. More like my um, off-brand, not really an Apple pen that I was supplied by work. Um, it went flat. So... Luckily, we got to a natural break in the material. We can stop that. Go away. Don't need to see my face that large. 
Yes, yes, I'm sure. Now, oh, uh, JS, I've only got one lightning cable, and the iPad is plugged in with the lightning cable. We're not an iPhone family. So, uh, there was once one in the house, but I don't know where it is. I would like to uh, do something about this size. Let's make the font size slightly larger. Oh, I've got to make this live. Auto compile on. Yay. Nice and large. What? What? All right, this is highly entertaining, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, using the iPad. <clears throat> Pull that, charge that. What is going on? Oh, I'm going to sort that one out later. Get rid of this. Keyboard, mouse. Back together. Um, yeah, Tyson. But now I've just suddenly discovered that is the thing. Wasted most of the time already. Where's the actual charging cable? Unless it's a micro USB. No. Is it a USB C? Oh, my goodness. Adventures. All right, that should be charging. Yes. All right, I'll continue. Ah, oh, Chris, ho ho. That sounds like a great option. I've done it before for conversations, but uh, if I had a actual document camera, I'd probably be using that. All right. Hopefully, everyone's back. I will do this for a bit and then resume. Okay. All right, I am not going to mess, mess around with typos too much. All right, let's get back to it. Uh, oops, all oh, my shortcuts are gone.
So if we have a commutative square in a category C, so it's called a push out square. that even rendered. So it's got a push out square if for every other now I probably want to call these things um, <coughs> Let's call this one F, this one G, and just probably got to make these or these ones. Let's just give them boring names. That one's called M. So this one, right? This is K L. Right, normal uh, normal service will resume shortly. So we have this font larger on the right. Sure. Uh, let's see if we can make this. Oh, even better. I'll just zoom in. Sure, it's no, it's not quite on the page. Let's see if I can go up a size. I know tech starts complaining at some point. Might be like, eh, I don't care about the size, and I'm going to give you tiny fonts. <coughs> okay, so given any other push. Uh, sorry, uh, any other commutative square, uh, there's unique morphism. Um, <clears throat> what do I want to call it? C. Ah, uh, yep. Thank you. such that um, I have two equations, namely that F is C composed with N and G is C composed with M. So you can draw these as commutative triangles, but I'm not going to do that right now. Okay, so what are some examples of this? Well, this is super abstract. So let's start with set. Scroll this down. Oh, please. Okay. <clears throat> Examples. So let's take category of sets. And so then, for instance, what does it do? A square is a push-out square. Um, precisely when P square is a push-out when P is equal to um, the disjoint union of the two sets n and m mod the relation generated by where um, 
you have uh, LX should be equivalent to KX for all X in L. So you take the disjoint union of the two sets and then anything in one of the sets that comes from L it gets glued to the corresponding thing in the other set. So this is easiest to see when uh, these two maps L and K are injective. Um, <clears throat> so it's literally just um, this gives a pair of subsets in N and M respectively and since uh, the, the functions L, little l and K are bijections onto their image you have a bijection between the images which are sitting inside N, sitting inside M and we just identify them together and then in this case it turns out that L is the intersection of N and M Wing sets along um, let me just say it's like a common subset up to identifying isomorphic sets in a sensible way uh, L is actually equal to inside X okay so as a special case sorry I'm just going to some pass skip stuff but I'm not going to do anything too clever just now um, so we can take L to be empty Oh, equals sorry yep yeah. um, thank you Tyson so, so in which case the equivalent the equivalence relation we get is entirely trivial so I should maybe mention um, so quotient the equivalence nation generated in case is empty so um, well it's trivial I should say the original relation is empty so the equivalence relation generated by it is just X is equivalent to X and nothing else. And so um, <clears throat> maybe I should have some notation. So something like X is equal to N SQ cup subscript L M okay so somehow I'm I'm taking the union of N and M but then gluing them along L somehow 
uh, uh, I'm not sure where you mean an X, Tyson. Ah, oh, I've got a typo in the command. Yeah, thanks, Space Kitter. <clears throat> All right, so that's. But um, another specific example. Um, so another special case. Yeah, so the square cup. Oh no, I got it. Uh, square is a push out. So I'm not sure what you mean, Tyson. So it's a push out in the category of sets. I should say square is a push out. in uh, second line of example oh yes oh I've written X in places I should write P in fact lots of places Um, Tyson, no, this is new notation. So P, uh, I'll, I'll press on. I can't quite see where you mean. inside P it's a bit of lag in the rendering that's better cool another special example um, is if a uh, special case you take n equal to uh, a single point, a single element set. Um, so then, um, so P is M. square cup a single point oh no asked sim so we're now the equivalence relation generated by um K of X equals now the map L is is nothing right it maps everything in L to a single point <clears throat> so in particular for all X in L uh, K of X uh, X and x prime in L, k of x, and k of x prime are identified. So this is taking um, the subset, which is the image of of the set L inside M. And crushing it all down to a single point. 
some special notation. Well, looks like um, M mod. K of L. Oh, I should say, <coughs> special for this when K is injective. So it's basically a subset M mod L. <clears throat> well, this is a not a great notation, and when we use it in context, it'll be clearer. So later, more of this later. So don't worry about that for now. Um, all right, so let's that's kind of some set like things. So Chris, um, I'm identifying L with the subset inside M. It's, yeah, it's sort of category theoretic flexibility to say an injective map is basically a, a sub thing, a subset. All right. So that's so here's some better examples. Um, so let's see if I can get um, maybe this example one. Example two. So then uh, let's take R mod so so for instance vector spaces like vector spaces over R or something so then um, let's do the case where uh, L is the trivial module So let's just pull up a diagram again, just so we got something to look at. And now L is going to be zero. That doesn't need a name. That doesn't need a name. <clears throat> See, then the square is a push out if uh, m is isomorphic to m direct sum n or vice versa and the maps n and m are the usual inclusions so the specific choices of maps in the square matter right? i could have some random linear maps n and m and i could take them to be the zero maps this wouldn't be a push out square but it has to be the inclusions uh, n oh sorry yep thank you tess Okay, that's not going to work. No hook left arrow. Okay. So in general, what do we have? So instead of taking sets 
and identifying things by um, an equivalence relation, what we're going to do is quotient by a submodule or a subspace. So uh, let's see, so it'll be in general have a submodule. Uh, let's call it. It's a nice letter on my keyboard. J is the image of the map and it's going to be this is where L is not zero environments confused this is now uh, n direct sum m which sends x to um, I can't remember what my uh, that was k and l k x minus l x Something like that. Uh, it doesn't like. A giant red screen. Nope, I didn't have a package loaded that allowed for the align environment. All right, so <clears throat> I take this submodule of n plus m, and and then we have the. Module P is isomorphic to the direct sum mod J. And now I'm on the next page. Ugh, giant gutter. Alright, DMN, I know you're. Probably better at LaTeX than me. Uh, I need uh, the geometry package. Let's see. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember margin commands. <clears throat> margin equals little. See if that works. I want tiny margins. There we go. Now it's giant. Oh, okay, that's even worse. What would be nice? One inch. Yeah, let's try that. Top, bottom margin, bottom margin. Someone look it up. Oh, for now, we'll just do one each. Gonna be better than the generic one. Oh, 
Oh, test, thank you. Uh, bottom, okay. Yeah, it's done something. Check we're on the screen. Make sure I'm all the way uh, right. Yeah, working on that. This is a fun experiment, that's for sure. For everyone's patience. Okay, that's good. All right. So these are these are some special cases. Um, we can do the same thing with um, combinatorial surfaces. This is. Yeah, Tess, I never thought about that. It's just, I thought it might just reset the options in the second call. Example three. Now it's gone. Now it's too big. I think it was using both left and right options, but from different package calls. So example three, it's better. Combinatorial surfaces. Uh, comma. All right, thank you. Wow, that's a good diagnosis. Okay, so combinatorial surfaces. <clears throat> we can uh, think about what it means to be a push out and it basically means the same as in sets, except we're now doing it dimension by dimension. So let's steal our push out diagram from above. So if it's one of combinatorial sets, then each uh, dash x, uh, yes it is, because um, yeah. I don't think I can explain it right now, given the uh, general technical difficulties taking up time. Um, <clears throat> so the trick is, when you go to check the property that a pushout satisfies, which is called its universal property, 
uh, you find that um, this is exactly what you need. So if I had a map, hmm, yeah, I can explain it more fully in Discord later or some offline uh, channel. So let's take a suggestion from before. Yep. I'll pop it in Discord. I just want to make sure that I'm not assuming where people are. So if this is true, if this is a push out, then each square is a push out. And now I'm running into index collision with other symbols. Okay, now each of these is the I dimensional component of the map of uh, combinatorial surfaces. I think that's all of them. Yep. So for I equals zero one, no, zero is at that end. This is a push out of sets. So if we need to calculate a push out or describe a push out of combinatorial surfaces, we just say what's happening at the level of edges and triangles and, and vertices. Um, okay, any questions? Yeah, small mental break. All right, took a long time. So, in particular, I should say uh, we are interested in the case where. Yeah, Chris, very amusing. Oh, code check failed. What is going on? Where is the code problems? At least I can give you all this PDF at the end. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, so Deus Ex, I've watched people do, um, it's probably not specific to proof assistance, but people going, oh, here's my formal proof in a, in a, uh, Emacs buffer and they're playing around and running the proof and editing it and it's just absolutely mad. Yeah, it may have been Agda, who knows. <clears throat> also in um, live lean code demonstrations. And one that was also a bit uh, a bit cheaty in that it was uh, pre-recorded macros that just advance at the step of any individual, any key on the keyboard. All right. Yeah, all right. Everyone's shaking it out. All right. <clears throat> so we're particularly interested in the case where um, each K, I, and L, I are injective. 
in. Right, so it's like a subsurface and we're gluing together two surfaces, two combinatorial surfaces along a subsurface. Um, and from the definition that uh, each ni and mi are also injective. Okay, so given such a push-out square, I'm going to rewrite it with different notation because these L's and stuff are fine for generic, but I want to evoke something specific and I've got some specific labels here I you let's build forms that's going to be V JV you just keep the questions rolling in oh yeah thank you thank you Jess it's as bad as someone doing a uh, document camera and just right off the bottom and also because that's annoying me I should be on the outside and P here is going to be X so let's suppose uh, push out Razor, that's a good question. I don't know for sure, but I suspect it's a kind of back formation from the dual operation called pullback, um, which ultimately comes from I don't know, geometry or topology or something. And so that is something you. you there's some data and you're pulling it back from the co-domain of a map to the domain and this is somehow um, you're pushing out the square to get its bottom right corner so you start from the information of just the W U and V and the maps between them and you somehow pop out the the bottom right corner of the square some combination of those um, so Luke yeah that's that's a different operation so there's a pullback in um, geometry and in uh, algebraic geometry and so on and it's not quite the same as this so the pullback there is only sort of uh, related to the normal category theory notion of pullback and this is not related at all to the way that you dualize that operation yeah so it's dual in a different way all right so let's say we have this suppose we have a push out diagram Right, so this is now we abstracted it <clears throat> right we're saying I've got a push out diagram and now by the magic of functors I want to apply some of the functors that I know this tape holding the um, thingy on is wobbly um, where all maps are injective. Right. So 
given a commutative diagram, you can apply a functor to everything in it. So, um, right, so every object gives a, a new object, a cochain complex, and every map of uh, combinatorial surfaces gives a map of cochain complexes, and the properties of a functor tell us that this diagram still commutes in uh, the category of cochain complexes. Something's wrong to close these. So, what does this look like? Um, well, I will copy the diagram. And I'll put. See bullet in front of everything. So this is like literally applying the functor to everything in the diagram. And uh, we have to turn around all the arrows so don't look, cover your children's eyes. something a bit naughty here literally turning around all the arrows um, so razor yeah a functor by default is a covariant uh, yeah so we're going to do the maps too and so a contravariant functor is uh yeah so here it's secretly it's a what am I called? contravariant <clears throat> cause all my arrows have turned around and I've got to put little asterisks on all the maps make sure I get all of them Sweet. All right, so, and this, I get this new commutative square, but this is, um, let's see. So you need to have uh, your funk to have special properties yeah, sorry, I just noticed that, Tess. Um, <clears throat> you need to have your funk to have special properties for it to send a push-out square to a push-out square. So here, this is maybe not really a big deal. And so even worse, uh, when we apply... So I want to stop here because this... this um, this commutative square is kind of important. Uh, space Kitter, it's something about... Well, in this case, it's the adjective is continuous, but that's, don't, don't think about that too hard. So when we apply the cohomology functor, so we still get a commutative diagram but now it's very much not a push out in any sense of the word
All right, so <clears throat> if we were in the realm of Van Kampen's theorem, the Cypher Van Kampen theorem, which is completely inappropriate and does not apply here, uh, you would get something like, oh, it's a pushout square. But it's really not in this case. <clears throat> um, and at, almost at this point, we've lost too much information. So it's this middle square here. Um, well, let's see, can I highlight? No. Um, this commutative square, this is in, in cochain complexes, we can work with this because it's still um, quite a lot of information. Right? Thinking back to earlier last week, in one sense, there's too much information for our final answer, but there's still enough information that we can work with it. Whereas once we get down to uh, the, the, the commutative square of these cohomology modules, all the action has happened and then there's not enough traction to actually do any calculation. So just to emphasize, we're interested in calculating the cohomology of X from the cohomology of the other, other corners of the square. But once you're at this point, it's too late. So we sort of stop in the middle and that's, that's going to be the next big section. So I want to just do one more operation to this data and then uh, let's see if I can get this done. All right. So I'll just write that down X from the other data. Okay. There's plenty of space. All right. So I should point out that I can unpack this commutative square of chain complexes. Uh, copy it over. So get your drawing fingers ready. This is meant to be W N P N This corner is U N R to the U N So this is each entry in the co-chain each of the chain complexes So, commutative square So we have a bunch of commutative squares of R modules and compatibilities, um, you know, the, the delta maps but at heart, we've got a commutative square of R modules, and this is something that's much more tractable. Right, these are linear maps. Um, what we're going to do, but uh, having a square is a bit um, unwieldy, so we're going to fold into a sequence. Okay. So I don't need that one.
sorry, it's zero. All right, I'm not even happy with that. the two opposite corners together and then R to the W N sorry I'm not talking a lot because I'm trying to compose these in my head I usually have to talk through live teching. Uh, that's not what I want. Yeah, I use the term loosely. Um, uh, let's see. Now, this is the good one. So, you see this different stuff a lot. Okay, fold this into a sequence, it's gone. Oh, it's, there it is. <sighs> All right, what an effort. So here's a fun fact, and you should check this. Um, This is a short exact sequence of R modules. So the only hard part is knowing that the map to this right hand uh, module is subjective but if we start with um, <clears throat> any function from w to r then uh, let's call it k we can extend k by zero to the rest of un and then define h to be the trivial function constant at zero and then that maps down to your given k so in fact even better uh, in fact we get a short exact sequence I'm going to scroll down in one moment of k chain complexes.
to you. Direct sum is the same thing for V. Same thing for W to zero. All right, and what does a short exact sequence mean for cochain complexes? It basically means that in each dimension, it's a short exact sequence of R modules. Okay, and so we want um, the cohomology which just to remind you is the cohomology of this cochain complex and suppose we know the cohomology modules of the other things there one is w and one is v okay so we're practically out of time So some people may know the magic word. Um, <clears throat> but I hope that even if you don't know the magic word of this procedure, then um, it's clear that there's going to be some algebra going on because the cohomology of X is somehow taking well I may even go back up here or well, we're taking a sub module of this right the kernel of Delta and then quotienting by a sub module of that and we're supposed to relate this to some other quotients of sub modules in these other two slots and it's not clear how you would extract that um, especially seeing as um, it could be that the cohomology of u and v is much is is nearly trivial and so how do you calculate this cohomology of x anyway so homological algebra is like is the tool whereby we can start to attack this problem okay so before we do that uh, next lecture we're just going to introduce general delta sets which are like combinatorial surfaces uh, except of arbitrary dimension and yes there is an extra comma where is it there because it's a direct sum of two things there should be two entries thanks Tess <clears throat> yeah so we have to talk about delta sets which are the generalization of of um, combinatorial surfaces but we've sort of seen enough that we kind of got most of the tools at least some of the con most of the concepts now we just need to say let's go to other dimensions do them all at once all the definitions you've seen so far will work um, or extend or generalize in a reasonably straightforward way and then we can uh, start to figure out how you do this stuff so thank you everyone I will
uh, see you all tomorrow and yeah that's people who ask questions that I didn't get to today pop them in discord in the lecture chat channel and cool Sarah.